Uh, this is a tutorial uh, where we're going to be talking about um, NB Dev, how to use it, and kind of the development process. Uh, it'll be a fairly brief introduction, and there'll be more videos coming soon with more, more and different and interesting ways to develop software. And I am here with Hamel. Do you want to say hi, Hamel? Hi, everybody. Hamel's joining I'm, I'm us here. from uh, where are you, Hamel? I'm actually at the uh, R Studio conference uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, tomorrow we're doing the launch of MB Dev because it's built on Quarto, which is uh, so uh, I'm, I'm here in a hotel room. <laughs> awesome. Um, thanks for joining us in the midst of your uh, conference. Um, all right, let me share my screen here. Um, great. So um, as uh, Hamel mentioned, um, we're going to be using NB Dev today, which is um, which works with Quarto to take a um, a bunch of Jupyter notebooks and to turn it into a uh, a, a complete software package. Um, so we're going to walk through how we would go about doing that from scratch. Um, it's actually much more exciting than that. But <laughs> go on, get us excited. We can overdo it. Um, <clears throat> Not only will we create a software package, but we'll we'll show you how you can get a documentation site, a beautiful documentation site that's searchable for free. You'll get CI for free. Um, you'll get an amazing way to do unit tests and testing all within the same context. It's something that has made me more productive, at least 10 times more productive, um, you know, while building all kinds of different software projects. I think you know I've been using MB Dev for about four years now, or three three years, and you know I've done a lot of different types of, or made a lot of different types of software. Everything from uh, like CLI apps to to API clients to ex, you know I've worked on extensions of the Python programming language with Jeremy, um, and a bunch of other things. And it's a very, it's interesting like how many different use cases that it's it's a like a really good fit for. Um and it's uh I, I think it's wonderful. So I'm really excited to show it to everybody. What about you, Jeremy? Like how do yeah, you I feel? Mean, it's, I um I think the big thing for me is I don't really enjoy writing software very much when I'm not using NB dev now because I don't um get as much get into that flow state, which is such a pleasure, you know. Um so using a notebook, because I'm doing exploratory programming, I'm really um, in the zone the whole time. I, I very rarely have mysterious bugs um, because everything along the way I've built an exploratory way. I know exactly how it works and it's very easy to fix any problems. Um, so I'm kind of in this continuous zone of, of productivity, which feels enjoyable, you know. And I've had various ways of trying to achieve something like that before MBDev existed, but I never had the same experience that that this gives me. Um, you know, the other thing, as you mentioned, is like you get all this stuff for free, you know, so the fact that I can quickly whip out in a couple of hours a complete project with continuous integration tests, documentation, pip installers, all that stuff is is pretty cool. So that's what we're going to build today, just a kind of a a fun little sample project. It's not going to do anything interesting. This one, um, it's going to be based on this uh, book, uh, Think Python, um, by Alan Downey, which is a really great book. And we're going to build a, a, a deck of cards. Um, so they're basically going to be inspired by the deck of cards idea that comes from his book um, to do a bit of a OO programming in Python. And we're going to end up with a, a documentation site, a Conda package, a PyPy package tests and continuous integration which before this video is finished. Am I missing anything, Hamel? Is that what we're going to have? Yeah, yeah, we're okay. going to have all that. Yeah. Great. So the starting point for creating um, an MB dev package is uh, to create a repository. Um, uh, the smoothest path is generally to use GitHub. It's not strictly required. Um, so here we are on GitHub. I'll go ahead and create a repository and uh, call it um, NB Dev Cards, for example. Give it a description. Give it an Apache license, create the repo. There it is. Okay, uh, so that's step one. Um, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna um, clone this repo and turn it into an MP Dev 
repository. So I'll click the copy button. I'm going to head over to my terminal and we'll clone it. That repo, uh, MB Dev cards, and this is assuming that I've already got MB Dev installed. So to install MB Dev, um, you can follow the directions on the home page. Um, so there's a written tutorial, um, and just above it, you'll see the pip install or conda install commands you can use. Um, MB Dev is um, very, very lightweight. Uh, it has very few dependencies. Um, dependencies are basically fast core and exec NB. That's about it. You don't even need Jupyter or anything to, to, to run it. Obviously, to author stuff, you'll need Jupyter. Um, but it's, yeah, it's a very lightweight um, library. Um, so once you've got it installed, if you type nbdev underscore and hit tab, you'll find that there's a bunch of um, command line tools that it's installed for you. And so you can get a list of them here on the nbdev main docs page. Um, and the one we're going to use is nbdev new. Um, and you can also see a list of them anytime if you do nbdev help in the terminal as well. With the, you know, you get a short description of all of them. Great. And, you know, this is actually a good example, Hamel, of how um, we don't have to do anything to keep our documentation up to date because the doc, our documentation being an NB, NBDev is written in NBDev. And so the documentation actually uses exclamation mark. That means run a shell command in Jupyter followed by that shell command and the output here. So the output in our documentation will always be up to date because it's running the actual code. Um, so that's one. This is this is huge, things. because like the way that most people create documentation is they copy and paste code into Markdown, and they Yuck. copy and paste the code output into Markdown, and it becomes stale. Oh yeah, it becomes a big headache, and that's why nobody writes documentation. Nah, but couldn't be bothered. This is I'm why I take care. NB Dev is for lazy people like me. I'm very lazy, and I don't I'm not prepared to do things twice. Um, okay, so NB Dev new. Um, so you can pass minus H to any nbdev command to find out um, how to use it. Um, in this case, it's very, very simple. Um, you just, this got no com um, command line arguments. So you can just go ahead and just run nbdev new. So as you can see here, um, when I run nbdev new, it figures out all the details of my repo um, and it creates a file called settings.any. And settings.any is your, your home for all the stuff that you need for your app. For your library, and um, the um, the neat thing about this for a lazy person like me is that you only have to put this stuff in one place at one time, like the version number and your details and so forth. Um, uh, yeah, it means that you don't have to worry about putting these things in multiple places for your documentation, for your PyPy install or whatever. It's all going to come from one place, and you don't have to worry about it. Um, yeah, it's great. Hmm. Otherwise, you know, like package management has so much boilerplate. It's overwhelming. And this makes it to where you can actually do it like a, in, like and stay sane. So the next thing we're going to do then is create, um, let's see what we've got here. So it's given us um, an OO core notebook, an index notebook, a readme, a setup. Um, and some style sheet info. So we'll learn about what all these things are in a moment. Um, so let's start by opening up the, the home page that you're going to be using. Um, so index.ipynb is going to become your home page, um, as you can see. And OO core. In the home, home page for what? The home page for the docs? Yeah, home page for, for your project, documentation right? website, exactly. And, and also is become, going to become like the, the first thing that you create for your library. And we only really, well, we're going to use a couple of modules, so that's that's fine. Um, in fact, um, I think for this one, we're not necessarily going to have one called core. I think we're going to have cards and a deck. We're going to put them just for explanation into two different modules. So maybe we'll create cards first. So maybe we'll rename this to OO cards or card. Yeah, card. You want to say something about the OO in front? Does that mean anything to you? Why I mean, do you do that? I like, yeah, I think it's helpful to have things have some ordering, like the order in which things are designed to be A, read and B, built. Like not so much how the software builds it, but how you built it. So that, you know, the nice thing about this kind of literate programming approach is that 
because the documentation is the source the, because because the source code are notebooks somebody who wants to get up to speed on your library is reading notebooks you know um in fact you know nb dev is a good example of that so if we go to the github repo for nb dev and we're like okay well let's learn about how this software is written i can start on the very first one and i know that's that's what i need to start reading to start understanding how this is written and um you know i can start Okay, so here's what the settings.ini is, and here's where it comes from. Um, in fact, even better might be if we look at um, exec NB, which is the um, library that we've written to help work uh, with notebooks. As you can really see, if we start at the very start here, like literally, you know, it's prose. Because like this was my exploration when I started writing this is like what's a notebook so I started opening them and reading them and printing out what's in them and so therefore when you know when you the reader start reading my code you're following me on my journey of understanding yeah what what's what's going on at every step and then you can see when I've written a function you can understand why I've written that function because I've just explored up to a point where we can see that's the function I now need um, so for example nB to dict is basically doing things that I've just done step by step in prose. So yeah, that's the main thing. You know, the ordering of the file names is also used by default to order the table of contents in your documentation. So that's another good reason to have it make some sense. So that's the only reason I'm using those numbers there. Um, so yeah, we're also going to have a a deck of cards. So we'll call this one 01 deck. So that's going to be a home page. That's going to be a module for cards. This will be a module for decks. Um, in real life, I would probably be putting these in the same module because they're not going to be very big, but this is just good for demo, I think. Um, so each notebook is going to produce one .py file, one module. Uh, so what do you want that module to be called? And this is going to go up here. So there's you'll see there's some special comments um here in the notebook they always start with hash pipe and if you've ever used quarto before this will look very familiar because in quarto it's exactly the same um you can see special comments with hash pipe here as well um so these comments that are used in quarto and nb dev are used to tell quarto or nb dev something about this code um so for example um We'll be learning about ShowDoc in a moment, and we have to import ShowDoc. Um, but the fact that we're doing that is something that the reader of your documentation doesn't care about. So we hide this uh, from the documentation that's built. Um, so this special one here called default X, this is the default export. This is what we're going to export um, symbols here into what module. We're going to import it into a module called card.py. Um, this is markdown in our notebook. And so this is where we can start typing things that we want to appear both for the reader of our source code and also it's going to end up in our documentation. Um, so we could write, for example, card, a basic playing card, um, a simple API for creating and using playing cards. So this is the description. Um, it might be so, worth the point that um, this having this uh, header one in this note block is a kind of an MB dev shortcut. And, and the, what happens is this becomes the title of your page and that and that quote block becomes the description of your page when it renders. Yeah, maybe a good way to um, understand how this works is to look at a library. So let's take exec NB again. Um, and open up one of its notebooks. So let's take 01 NBIO. And at the same time, also open up its rendered documentation. And so you'll see here we've got NBIO and shell. And here in the documentation, here they are NBIO and shell. And if we look at the notebook, you can see here is the header one. So that's become the title and the contents. And the description here has come from the description. Um, and that's used in things like the um, metadata of the page as well. Um, so you can see the title, for example, gets built from that automatically. So that's a good way to kind of understand how to use NB Dev and how your choices 
make things appear is by looking at a sample. And then you'll see each of the second level headings ends up as, and third level headings ends up as in the table of contents here. So um, I kind of like to think about, well, how do I, how do I want my, um, how do I want this to behave, you know? And so we're basically going to be, we're going to be creating a playing card. Um, so I'm going to want to have some kind of like something which I could do, like create a card, passing it like a numeric suit and a rank. Um, so we could create, uh, you know, a list of suits, for example. Uh, let's pop that up here, maybe. Um, so we've now got a bunch of suits. So you could like say suits one, for example. Why is that not printing out anything? Is it something about the font, perhaps? Or... Hmm. Yeah, something about Python's Unicode handling, maybe? That would be my My guess. computer, it actually visually looks different than this. I don't get huh? the colored. Like, I don't, uh, oh, okay. Like, yeah, it, I don't ever see these colors or anything on my computer when on the same notebook. So, so this is where like NVDiv is really helpful, right? Because, you know, I'm not going to end up with some weird bug deep in my code because I'm exploring as I go. Um, but you could like split things. Okay, so I think what we'll do instead, since we discovered that doesn't work, um, which I think just shows my ignorance about how Python uses Unicode, let's put them, create a list of strings instead. Oops, there's it. Okay, that's more like what I was expecting. Mm. My guess is maybe I think like some emojis are actually like consists of multiple kind of code points or something. I mm. don't quite remember the terminology and it kind of ends up changing the color. Yeah, like, you know, like oh, a like flag, an, like an a flag. flag or something. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's that's useful. Um, so then we're going to have all the different card ranks. Um, and so there isn't really a rank zero, so it's got a placeholder there. Um, and so this this code is kind of loosely based on Alan Downey's book. Um, mm -hmm. So cool. So um, so if we want to create a class that represents a card, we'll say we want a class, and it represents a card. Um, and so when we create one of these, Python calls the dunder in it. Um, when you create an object of a class. And so we're going to be passing in some suit and some rank. And so then we'll just be setting self.suit just to store it away, basically, and self.rank. We'll set them equal to the suit and the rank. Now I should mention, like, um, as you well know, Hamel, the way I the way I write code is different to like the way most people write Python code. And um uh, and in particular, there's a lot of like specific recommendations in how to write Python code in a document called um, PEP8, um, which is kind of like a, a default style guide for Python code. Um, yeah, folks who are working in an organization that uses PEP8, like don't take my particular approach to coding as a role model. Um, I will say though that I've been coding for 40 years now um, uh, um, and coding nearly every day for 30 years. Um, and my particular approach to coding is not random. There's a particular reason for it, um, which I've documented on the fast AI coding style. And it based on kind of many decades of work from people much smarter than me, uh, particularly Ken Iverson, the Turing Award winner. Um, uh, which is all to say, yeah, I, I like my way of coding and that's what I'm going to show here. Um, but if you're um, yeah, working in an organization that uses Python in a more traditional way, you should go with your own organization's coding style. The style that I've developed, uh, as I say, it's partly based on years of research from other languages, decades of research. It's also partly based on experience with um, exploratory and literate programming in particular. So it more closely uh, follows the kind of style you would see from Lisp or APL or Julia programmers or F sharp programmers, like programming languages that where working in the REPL, working in an interactive and exploratory way is more a part of the, the culture and toolkit of that, um, yeah, of that environment. Can, can I say something about this? Please. So, you know, I think it's uh, uh, important 
if you are interested in MBDEF to approach it with the right mindset. And I think uh, one mindset that's been helpful for a lot of people is to, uh, you know, look at and the things that we're showing you today as a dialect of Python, because not only are we, you know, going to show you, uh, you know, this way of developing code in a notebook, but there's also, uh, you know, there are some extensions to the Python programming language that Jeremy has made that that kind of enhance the REPL experience. And so if you think of it as a dialect, then you can kind of open up your mind to, you know, a different, different ways of working and also different conventions. Um, so I think that's really important. Yeah, it makes sense. So while you were talking, I was just uh, starting to fill in the kind of like information I would want to be passing on to a reader of my code or documentation. That's great. I think this is like really, is this is super powerful for many reasons. Like often I find that when I'm writing the documentation like this, um, you know, I discover bugs in my code or I discover clunky things in my code. Like, hey, this is very hard to explain. And I end up refactoring it because of that. Yeah, definitely. So trying to explain in our docs as we go why things are as they are. Okay, so there's our ace. All right, so now we can create a card. Um, so that's not very helpful. <laughs> um, and so that's the that's the default representation. Um, so we can override that using Dunder STR, which is a Dunder str. Um, which is uh, the Python way of saying, this is how I want to stringify my object. Um, and I think a simple way to do this would be just to use an F string and say, this is like a, um, first of all, the rank. So that would be the self dot rank. And then we would want to look that up in all the ranks. Um, and then we'd want to do something similar for suits. Okay. And so that's what we're going to see if we print it like so. Now, as you'll see, it's a little different to how it's represented in a notebook. So quite often I like my notebook representation to be the same as how it's printed. So an easy way to do that is uh, by default, Jupyter will use the Dunder Repra um, method to return the representation in the notebook. So if I just say, I want this to be the same as the string version, I can just do that as we see. And so, so we can say, uh, so we can add some documentation here. Um, a playing card created by passing in a, passing in rank from ranks and suit from suits. Okay. Is an example of creating and displaying a card. And for the attentive, people that are really paying close attention, these back ticks that Jeremy put in his doc string, just keep that in the back of your mind, that's actually doing something special. I and mean, you'll see that. Yeah, I mean, we can look at it now. So what's gonna happen automatically is this is gonna be turned into documentation. So for example, if we look at this one, um, that's a good example. So here's a function called dict2nb. Um, you can see here that it's created some documentation. Um, and in fact, we could make the documentation nicer. Well, let's take a look at it first. So there's the documentation it's going to auto-generate. It's going to call this function called show doc. You actually don't have to put it in here manually. It'll do it automatically when we build the docs, but you can kind of get a bit of a preview. Um, something which I think is nice to do is to give um, each parameter some documentation. So to do that, you can use something we invented called documents. And this works like so. Um, you basically put a comment after a parameter and say, and give it a comment. So an index into suits. And so that's kind of nice because I can now make my doc string a bit simpler. Um, and in fact, I don't need to say passing in rank and suit because you can already, already see that they're right here. So really at this point, we can strip it all the way back. Um, you know, and having like, oh, in my opinion, having overly ver verbose documentation isn't a good idea. If you have more information than needed, then you know, it's it's distracting to the reader. We want the right amount of information. So at this point, you can see here, this is how it's gonna be represented. That's the exact information I want, very clear. And so the other thing we might then do is say, well, what 
what what type is expected. Okay, so that way you don't have to include that in the doc string because again, when we spit out this show doc, it's going to show me those types both in the table and also in the signature. So this again, it's me being lazy. I don't want to include any more information than I than I have to. As I say, we don't actually need this here. It'll be auto added for us. Um, so after a while, you kind of get used to what things look like. So you don't need it. But if you do add it, it's fine. It, it will see that you've added it. It won't add it twice. Um, An advanced feature we won't necessarily be discussing today is, you know, you can document other code bases with ShowDoc. Um, yeah. You know, there's another reason you might want to yeah, use it. Exactly. So you might create docs for something that you've written without NVDev or create docs for somebody else's library. And that would be done by using show doc and importing their library. So um, for example, if we wanted to, you know, document something from um, exec MB, for example, I could um, you know, import something like um, that thing we were just looking at, you know, and uh, start writing some markdown prose and also add wherever I wanted to. The actual documentation. And this bit here, this header, show doc blah, it's not going to appear. The only thing that appears in the documentation is the markdown output. Okay. Um, so I think, you know, in general, we probably want to be able to recognize, you know, when, when cards are the same or when they're less than or greater than some other card. Um, so what I kind of like to do for that is um, I kind of like creating tests to check that it's working correctly. You can either create them before or after. It doesn't really matter too much with exploratory programming. Um, so I would kind of be saying things. So you can um, import some basic testing functionality from FastCore. And you know, again, this approach of importing wildcards, it's like not the normal approach in a lot of um, Python libraries, but for exploratory programming, it works pretty well. Um, it's certainly not unheard of, like, for example, the Python standard library itself um, has a really famous library called TKenter, and you'll see that um, all of the examples in it actually use wildcard imports. So it's actually used in the Python standard library itself. Um, but uh, it's it's only a good idea. It, like, it's something you'd only want to do for libraries that are explicitly designed to work this way, um, because there's a somewhat advanced Python feature called Dunda all, which ensures that things work correctly when you do this. Um, normally that's a lot of work to create and not really worth the effort. Um, MB dev libraries do it automatically. So one nice thing about MB dev libraries is that they work very well in REPL oriented programming because they'll support using wildcard imports. Um, but again, it's something which if you're at an organization that uses kind of PEP8 and stuff, you might want to explicitly import each thing carefully. Um, but, you know, one nice thing about exploratory programming is for people that aren't very familiar with their IDE, they often, like, don't know where symbols come from or what they mean. So, for example, there's a thing in um, fastcore.test called test for equality, test ec. Um, in Jupyter, you don't have to worry about, like, you don't have to look up the top to find it, because at any point you can just stick a question mark after it, and it will tell you exactly where it came from. Um, and but furthermore, you can actually just put a second question mark and that'll give you the source code for it. Um, or you can write it without any question marks and it'll just tell you the, the details of the source and the parameters. Uh, or you can just hit um, open parenthesis and then shift tab and you'll get all the information here. So there's lots of ways, you know, in a REPL based environment of getting all this information without scrolling around and wasting time. Um, so we're going to test that, for example, a card like that should be equal to a card like that, um, where else a card with a different suit should not be equal, and a card with a different rank should not be equal. Okay, so if we run that, it doesn't work um, because we haven't defined equality yet. So the way you define equality in um, Python is by defining a dunder equality. And we could just check that the two tuples are the same. So if we check that uh, self.suit, comma, self.rank, 
equals, oh, we don't need B, it's going to be past the self, yourself, and then one other thing. Uh, and check that against um, a dot suit comma a dot rank. There we go. So they all pass. Um, now um, we're not showing uh, like totally perfect software engineering principles here. We should be checking that the types are the same and stuff like that. But we could at least give some indication um, that the types are meant to be a card. Um, this is a slightly weird Python thing that Python doesn't know what a card is until when you're inside a card. So nowadays you have to put it in quotes. Um, uh, you know, like I tend to like having my functionality all in one place though. So what I would tend to do at this point is I would often split this out. So in Jupyter, you can hit control shift hyphen to split a cell out. And, you know, I'd quite like to kind of have all this stuff defined down here in one place. So I'd have like equals, not equal, you know, and so forth. Um, so to define a um, a method outside of its class, which is kind of something that's pretty common in things like C++, for example, um, you can also do it in Python using something from, another thing from FastCore. So the main things in FastCore live inside it, uh, uh, utils. And one of the things that'll give us is something called patch. So we can add a quality to fast core just by saying patch. And we're just gonna say, what do you wanna patch? I wanna patch card. And one nice thing is now that actually exists. I don't need this weird quote thing anymore. So if I, now can I, I can define, as you can see here, I've defined card and then I've patched in a quality. And this is part of the, what I was talking about, the dialect of Python. This is one of the extensions that make it easier to write code yeah. in a notebook. And so I'd be inclined at this point to kind of introduce a section in my documentation here um, for comparison operators. Okay. Um, and so we'll automatically, we'll automatically get documentation for this. Um, so then we could do less than or equal to, or less than, I guess. So, um, so we would expect um, one, three to be less than two, three. Uh, so this will need to we just use a cert. There we go. Um, and similar thing for greater than. So LT and GT is what Python uses for less than and greater than. So this should not be the case for greater than. And then for less than, for greater than, we would expect that to be true. Okay, so that's all passing. Um, all right, I think that's basically our playing card. Um, so at this point, we can um, we can try it out. And so to create um, our card.py file, um, we can head over to here to our terminal and type nbdev underscore export. Yeah. We can type nbdev underscore export, and you'll see we've now got. Um, an nbdev underscore cards directory with a card.py file. We've decided not to use core after all, so I'll get rid of that. Um, so like one thing we could do at this point is to see whether that seems to be working okay by importing it. And this, you're in the index uh, notebook, so that's the home page. That's gonna be our home page, exactly. Um, so we can say like this web provides a card class you can use to create, display, and compare playing cards. Card one comma three. Suits are numbered according to this list. So you can see all that stuff has been imported into our environment uh, from nbdevs.card. So that's pretty handy. So we'll call this nbdev underscore cards. And we're not automating this bit, unfortunately. We probably should be. We'll have to copy the description over. So we might put a link here to where the inspiration for this comes from. A playing card, uh, a deck of cards. Demo of nbdev. 
based on ideas from um, Think Python 2, Think Python 2nd edition by Alan Downey. All right. Install using or to the hyphen or underscore. Yeah, so this is a this is our first um, little tricky issue, which is that um, hyphen and underscore are a special character in Python. Python modules can't have a hyphen hyphen and PyPy, I don't think, can have an underscore, or at least you don't normally see them. So we actually are going to have a different name. Um, so ideally, I wouldn't have picked a name with an underscore because that's the only, basically the only character that has this weirdness, um, but that's okay. Um, so to fix this, we have to change it in settings.any um, to say that we've actually got two different things. Um, so the lib name is actually, I guess, mbdev hyphen cards. And then the lib path is actually mbdev underscore cards. That's a little bit confusing. Um, this uh, percent %s business is um, part of the thing from the standard, the Python standard library called config parser. Um, it just copies the variables from user and lib name up here. And you can override them if you like. Um, all right. Um, should we maybe have a look at the documentation now? Mm -hmm. Okay. So to preview your documentation, um, you can type nbdev underscore preview, and uh, that will fire up a um, uh, that will fire up a Quarto web server for you. Um, and as you can see, it will automatically install Quarto um, if you don't already have it. Um, if you're on Linux, it'll do it automatically. I'm on Mac though, so it's going to pop up this window. Um, Quarto is updated reasonably regularly, so it's not a bad idea to make sure you've got the latest version anyway. All right, so let's run that again now that it's installed. So that's going to build each of my pages, and then what's going to happen is it's going to sit running in the background, and uh, and so it's just going to sit there running a little server on port 3000. So if we now go go to um, click on there, it's popped it open here, um, and so. Yeah, let's take a look. So NB dev cards, actually, let me pop this on the other screen so we can compare them more easily. So you can see how the heading, the summary, where it all is. Um, if you look at the card page, that, that's uh, interesting since. Yeah, so let's pretty... head over here and compare it to our card page. All right. Um, okay, so you can see all this stuff's been hidden. There's this info that we've got. And as you can see, we've got the auto-generated docs here. Okay, now this is a mistake. This shouldn't be appearing. And the reason why is that it's not being exported because I didn't export it. So I'll copy this export here and I'll paste it here. There we go. And then um, I've saved. I just hit save and you can see that it's um, automatically done this here. Um, and because these are like uh, start with an underscore, they're like considered hidden by Python, so it doesn't automatically create show doc. Um, we kind of don't do that because it, I, you know, we think a lot of people would not like it's. It's not that we're creating really something for users called Dunder equals. So like you could say show doc if you felt that your users were quite advanced and would know what that meant. Um, you know, you do it something like this, um, and it would pop up like so. Um, you know, personally, I try not to expect my users to understand stuff like that. So I would rather just kind of put in some markdown, I think. Um, and in fact, we could make all this a little bit shorter by then putting all this stuff together. Merge, so shift M merges, a bit more concise. Test of less than. And this is, this is really cool. I mean, I find this part to be really nice. Like you can choose which tests you want to show to your users and which ones you don't. Yeah. Because um, sometimes it makes sense to do it and sometimes it doesn't make sense to show. Yeah. It. In fact, you know, let's just for example, let's say that, you know, we just want to show them one test of each. 
which is fine. Like you don't necessarily want to overwhelm them with examples. So in that case, I would write hide here. And these are just for actual tests rather than uh, rather than showing examples. Yeah, so it's probably not a bad way, just one example of most of them. Okay. Um, so I really um, like the way you get this kind of auto-generated documentation. I mean, now that I kind of know what the docs are going to look like, I don't use it that much myself unless I'm doing more advanced websites. Um, an example of a more advanced website would be the NB Dev homepage. Um, the NB Dev homepage is actually generated from a notebook. And so that one, it was certainly helpful to have the auto-generated preview. Shall we do? Do you want to? Do you want to show? Do you want to talk about? Since we uh, mm -hmm. spent some time on tests, mm -hmm. do you want to kind of? How do we yeah, do, know? Do you want to do CI yeah. now, or should we do the? Should we do the deck first, and then we'll do CI? Yeah, we could. But you could show local tests. I think the local. Oh yeah, local tests. Of course, I forgot about those. All right. So, uh, for local tests, so I'm just going to run this in the background. We'll leave that running. So if you just type nv dev underscore test, and that's going to basically make sure all of your tests pass. Um, and, you know, we don't like to give you more information than needed, so it just <laughs> tells you if they do. Let's break one. Save that. And so you can see now it tells you that in 00, zero card, cell 20, um, and my colors could be better, but I'll fix that in my term sometime. It shows you exactly where the problem occurs and it expected three of hearts and it got a three of diamonds. And you can see it even uses the correct representation thanks to fast core test. Um, and at the end, it'll summarize a list of any notebooks that failed. So we'll go and fix that, save it, rerun our test. There we go. Um, and for these situations- To see what you can pass in, it'll run the tests in parallel using as many workers as you have CPUs by default. You can see how long they take to run. You can look at just particular files. So forth. There's lots of options you can give it. I was going to say, uh, when you're using MB Dev and you're debugging in real life, um, I think it's worth it to mention the hotkey for reload in run all. Mm. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah, you know, that's that's really useful. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So you want because when you run MB Dev test, it's going to run your notebook from top to bottom. So to rerun your notebook from top to bottom, if you just hit zero zero, that restarts the kernel. Um, and then there isn't a hotkey built in for running all cells, but it's a good idea to add one by hitting help edit keyboard shortcuts. Let's run them all, and we're all good to go. A lot of, I mean, a lot of people, well, including me, like to explore very interactively in notebooks and often go back up and rerun a cell and change things and see what happens. Um, but um, yeah, it's a very good idea from time to time to to hit zero, 00 and then rerun all the cells, or at least to head over to your terminal and run NB dev uh, test. Um, yeah, and right. another thing is like, you know, like when you get a failed test in your terminal, you do what I do, I'm um, just sharing my workflow, is I come back and I do restart run all, I get the error in the notebook, and then I hit the interactive debugger, like the percent percent debug, and I kind of go from there, see yeah. what's going on. Yeah, so, um, so just to explain, if we put a bug in here, you get an error, you can hit percent debug, and it will drop you into an interactive debugger, which is called PDB. It comes with Python, and you can do things like find out the value of any variable, like suit. You can find out the stack trace of where we are. You can get a listing of source code and so forth, and you can yeah, basically write any Python expression you like, um, figure out how to fix the bug, and away you go. All right, let's do a deck of cards. So we'll export this to something called deck. So generally speaking, you know, in your second notebook, it's pretty likely you're going to want to import the stuff from your previous notebook. And at the moment, I won't be able to do that. Actually, yes. Hang on, can I? Let's try it. Maybe because you did an editable install. Oh, uh, oh cards. And you got, they got it wrong. Yeah, the card, yeah. Did I do a local install? I don't remember doing that. I guess I must have. I thought yeah, so the reason didn't. that works, I guess, or maybe I did that without even thinking about it. If you type pip install minus e dot in your git repo, um, basically it's going to install 
the thing you're currently working on as a library, and it's going to be pointing at your actual source code. So every time you update it, it'll be there. Um, so that's how come I can import it. Um, all right. So. And now you might want to put the import in a separate cell and export it, perhaps. Yeah, exactly. So let's do that. Because that's actually going to be part of the library, is that we're probably going to want to use these cards. Mm -hmm. So that should be part of the exported. And actually, we should probably look at that. So let, let's take a look at, um, oops, I just managed to break everything, did I? Oh, um, let's just make sure this is actually going to run. There we go. So because I've got the um, Quarto server, NB dev server running in the background, it's constantly trying to compile my code. So I had it in a non-compiling state just before, which is why it complained. Um, so if I take a look at the NB dev cards card file, you can see this is the source that's created for me. Um, and so for example, if we now like, um, let's see. Um, so a full deck of cards is going to contain um, every for, for every suit and for each suit for every card, it's going to contain a card. Um, so that's not very helpful. So we can do the same trick we've seen before, which is to just join the cards together when we're stringifying it and set the representation to be the same as the string. There we are. Um, so now if we might just stop running our server for a bit, it's a bit annoying. Um, so when we could now export and we can see we've now got a deck.py. And you know, you can um treat this just like you would any normal source code. So for example, I use Vim. So if I go to card and I hit control right square bracket and Vim, it jumps me straight to the definition of card. Um, so like you can do what you know, I can jump back. So you can still like, you know, if you use VS code, you can still use it just like the normal way that you would look through source code. Um, or of course we can use the trick we've seen before, for example, double question mark to get, um, uh, why isn't that working? Mm -hmm. uh, oh yeah, because it's not exported. Your fast core utils test. Oh whatever. yeah, that was a mistake. Okay, so that needs to be exported because that's part of what we actually need. And you should put all your imports in a separate cell by itself. Maybe it's a good time to mention that. Oh, and then just a moment, so then we need to export the hat, and so then we could check that that's working. That's looking hopeful. So now zero, zero, run. Oh, sorry, I shouldn't look at deck. I should look at card, for example. There you go, you can get the source code. All right, so um, so Hamill just started talking about a um, one little wrinkle you have to be aware of when creating your code in NBDev, which is that there's one um, golden rule you have to keep in mind. And that golden rule is that you your cells should either contain imports uh, or non-imports, but not a mixture of the two. So you'll see this doesn't contain any imports. This doesn't contain anything but imports. Um, and the reason for that is that when it builds your docs, it has to be able to go through and run every one of your cells containing imports in order that it can then run all of your show doc cells correctly, um, but it's not gonna run any other cells. So just remember, don't have a cell that contains both a import command and also something else. Um, so that's the only slightly weird rule that you have to remember. Um, I think something else that I'd like to add to our deck is just to know how big it is. Um, so Dunder Len gives you that. And so by, um, so let's first create a deck, call it deck. Um, so notice the difference in case here, this is my object and this, this is my class and this is my instantiated object. Um, um, another thing that's useful is to know if a card is in the deck. So in uh, Python, they use a special Dunder thing called Dunder contains for that. Let's see if the, um, so just to remind myself, what are the, suits so a one of clubs is that in the deck let's rerun it okay so give this a doc string 
All right. All right. I guess um, we might want to create a hand now, but you might want to then deal a hand or something, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, but probably to do that, we want to be able to um, select a card mm -hmm. um, from the deck. So I guess, first of all, let's just uh, see if we've got all the information we need here. So um, let's say when we initially create a deck, all of the cards will be present at the 52 cards. And so this is where I'd put a test rather than just displaying it, because that way we're both showing um, the user what we're expecting, and we're also ensuring that that continues to be the case in the future. Just as a reminder for people not familiar, the test DQ is a wrapper around assert that just will give you a nicer error message. Yeah, pretty much. Assert that, the, assert that they're equal. So if they're not, it'll let you know what they actually were. So as you can see, like most of the fast AI library code tends to be just a couple of lines. So this line, this is one line of code. This function is defined with two lines of code. Um, so normally you can like, yeah, we've, I mean, there's good documentation for all this stuff, of course. So if you go to the fast core docs, you can go to test and see examples of all of them. Yeah, but often you can just quickly look at the source code if you want to see exactly what's going on. Uh, the ace oh, uh, clubs. Okay, so let's make it so that we can remove something from the deck. So we could just go ahead and edit the, the class. Um, but as I say, I kind of like to add things in after the fact, you know, just keep things nice and separated. Uh, we should generally it doesn't matter whether you have a space or not um, after your pipe character, but I know that at least at the moment in Knitter, which is an R library, it doesn't like the space. So it's probably not a bad idea. Most of the stuff you'll see in Quarto, all the stuff you'll see in Quarto always has a space. Um, all right, so let's um, patch in a pop to pop off a card from a deck. Um, so some index. Can default for the last card. And so again, we could add documents to this. Remove and return one card. Um, okay, so we'll just return self.cards.pop. So I wanted to import that. Oh, and we've got to tell it what to patch. Um, so let's try popping something. So if we pop something, we should get the King of Spades, you would expect. And we did. So if we create a new deck here and pop it off. So again, I would tend to turn this into a test. There we go. Okay. So let's export that. Uh, make sure everything's running okay. It is. Um, and so we can now do our preview again. So we can now see we've got our index page, our card page, and our deck page are all here. There's all our documentation. Uh, so one thing you'll notice here is that the back tick we used here for card has automatically become a hyperlink here to the documentation for that. Um, I won't be able to click on it right now because it's um, going because the, we haven't uh, put it on GitHub yet, um, but this will end, this will link to, in fact, I just copy the link, you'll get the idea, copy link address, paste it. So that's where our documentation for that's going to end up being. So you can just use uh, back ticks and it will automatically linkify, as we call it, um, that to the documentation. So that's pretty handy. And it works uh, across all your dev projects. Uh, yeah, because exactly. We have, yeah. And not just MB Dev projects. In fact, there's um, there's a a number of other things, including the Python standard library and pandas and NumPy and so forth, that you can install um, indexes for those so that they'll automatically linkify as well. Um, cool. So then you know we can show that this seems to be working correctly. Um, let's go to rerun this. Okay. So. Um, so I just re-ran that from the top to make it all work again. Um, all right, so that should be um, 
in our deck now, you can see that that's auto-generated that documentation. And we can also like check that pups behave in the way we'd expect it to be um, by getting a remove in there as well. So I'm just going to copy and paste this one from when I built before to save a bit of time for us. And so again, we can check to see how the preview is looking. Um, and so when we see this is not appearing here, we know what well, we forgot to export it. There we go, now it's appeared. Um, so it's not just for methods, we could also create a function. So I've got a function that I've created earlier, just for example. So here's one that draws some cards with all our replacement. So let's draw 13 cards without replacement. Oh, need a shuffle, about to add a shuffle. Maybe we'll just put that straight into the class just to show how that would look. So there's a shuffle. So since the shuffle here is directly in the class, we need to say whereabouts we want to document it. So the way we would do that would be to put a show doc. There we go. Um, so we're gonna to need to import random here. Oh, we need to put it at the top. Oh, one thing I should mention, it's okay to put an import statement in an exported cell because they're gonna be run either way. So that's the one difference is so you can put an import inside a cell that's exported. There we go. Let's take a look at how our documentation is looking. Nice. All right, Hamel, where should we head now? Um, oh, um, did we wanna create the command line interface? Yeah. Sure. Or you want to do a visualization to make sure your draws are doing or okay? Um, I mean, that's already in are the tutorial. It's not really whatever. anything extra. Okay. No problem. Um, yeah. I mean, the CLI is in the tutorial. Actually, the CLI is in the written tutorial as well. It's also really not anything extra. So, because this is already pretty long um, and it's not really MB dev specific. So, yeah, check out the, um, the, the written version of the tutorial of this online for a couple more um, handy little tricks. Um, okay, so to get it ready to send off to GitHub, to send it up to GitHub, one thing that I like to do is to make sure that there's like no unnecessary metadata in the notebooks. And so um, you can manually check to do that by using NB Dev Clean. Um, there's also some Git hooks you can install to do this automatically. You can look up in the docs if you're interested. Um, and so if you um, have a look now, we can see what's what we've got ready to go to GitHub. Um, so we can add all that. Um, yeah, not a bad idea just to make sure you've exported everything, um, make sure that the tests are working. So they're basically the three things. Uh, check the files. So there's gonna be um, continuous integration added, doc documentation deployment added, uh, the notebooks we created, um, some information about the website, our homepage, um, the two modules we created, our settings file, setup file, sidebar, and a style sheet. That all sounds good to me. Too tired today. Okay, so that gets sent off to GitHub, where we should find it. There it is. And so GitHub has something called GitHub Actions that automatically runs things that are in this github.github workflows folder. Um, so one thing you'll find here is that uh, when you push or when somebody puts in a pull request, um, it's going to run NB dev test, amongst other things. And it will also uh, run something called Quarto GHP, which will set up your um, GitHub pages. So while we wait for that, I'm going to go into pages and tell it that GH pages is the branch. So that's basically what it uses for GitHub pages. Um, okay. And so if we look at actions, we can see there we are, it's, it's all run. So the CI stands for continuous integrations. So that means our tests are passed and the deployment was completed. So you can actually click on these things to see them or the steps that they run. 
and you'll see that it installs all the Python stuff, and you can see it basically looks the same as our Quarto did when we ran stuff locally. And then finally, automatically, GitHub creates our web page for us. And so you can see it's busily building it there. It looks like it's finished building it. Okay, it's finished. And you can see it tells us here where it's been built to. So what I like to do is I tend to copy that, and then I go into my settings and paste it here. And there's our website. Awesome. And our links are working. Okay, so that's looking good. Um, shall we put this on PyPy, Hamel? Yeah. You know, and that's see, I mean, I just want to point out like most projects at this point, you would only just have code. Yeah. So at, th at this point, we have CI, we have a documentation site. And this is the point where, you know, when I'm personally coding and I'm kind of done at this point, and it's exciting because I just, like my colleague, you know, I just say, hey, like I created that tool you wanted. And then here's the website. And they're like, you have a website? I'm like, yeah, check it out. You can install and it from like, Pip. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And then they're like, wow, it's and then also you can just pip install it and also you have CI. Like, how did you do all this in such a short amount of time? Yeah. So it's awesome. Um our readme is not working. Oh, you know, the other thing we should have done is uh run um NB dev docs. And um the reason for that is that um so that's kind of does a trial run of the same thing that um that it's gonna have that GitHub Actions is gonna do. Um but what it also does is it updates our README to contain the same contents as the home page does. Um oh, I keep forgetting I haven't got this alias installed. So if we now look the other thing which we've got is a beautiful README. Uh, so that comes from our index.ipynb, and that's going to be the same as the home page. It won't be as beautiful as the home page because it's using more limited markdown, but the basic, you know, the basics are there. Um, okay, so we can see that there's an nbdev pypy to upload to pypy, and there's a, another one for conda, doing conda, or just nbdev release to do both. I'm just going to do pypy for now. All right, so let's run it, and it uploads to pypy. And just see at the end, it's also automatically bumped the version. So you can see here it's gone to version two. Mm -hmm. So I tend to like just go git commit minus am bump. And it says I can view it here. There it is. And you can see it's even put the project description, project homepage has all been done automatically, which I think is. Or the metadata. It looks like a very professional and polished library for something that we spent under two hours on. Um, Absolutely. And and furthermore, like it's you know it's not just for little quick two hour things like this. You know, I've, well, you and I have both written libraries that have taken years with thousands of lines of code and dozens of modules and tens or hundreds of thousands of users. Yeah. No, it's great. And imagine what it's like to make a PR into one of these projects. So let's just say I don't have any idea how DEC works at all. I'm like, what is this DEC thing? I've never seen it. I don't know. And um, without knowing anything about the code, I just go to that notebook and there's all there's already the entry point for me. There's the code and then there's mm. sample ways on how to run it with documentation right there. So there's no confusion. And then I can... You know, I've noticed that we got a lot of pull requests, with just high quality ones, making the documentation better, making the test better, because people read it, they get confused, and they just resolve their confusion. They just say, "Hey, I'm just gonna edit this real quick and submit a PR." Yeah, I mean, let's let's um, have a look at an example. So, um, yeah. Fast AI is an example of a package which uses MB Dev. Um, it's got over twenty thousand stars on GitHub, over seven thousand forks. Um, so here's an example of an open PR. And one thing that we'd use, which is fine, is there's a thing called review NB, which actually means I can click a button here. And uh, because it's, yeah, because it's all in notebooks, you know, I can immediately see the documentation that I've added and I can make comments on the documentation. Um, 
and if you know i can see the source code that's been changed i can see if they've added or removed any tests i can see if any of the output graphs or whatever have changed um and uh yeah it's 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 nice both for me as the person reviewing that pr and also as you say for the person making that pr that we're very much all on the same page about what's about what's going on so yeah i find we didn't get pretty pretty high quality pull requests to our projects and what's great is so this is only kind of the tip of the iceberg like there's a lot of exciting things so you can use the same tools that we shown today to just make a website let's say you don't want to necessarily write code maybe you want to just uh, write a blog um so we'll have a tutorial or a video like at some time in the near future that shows okay how do you do write a blog and then also uh, you can just have a website too that maybe you just want to make a tutorial on let's say how to use fast ai or how to use your favorite library you can use same set of tools to do that um and there's all kinds of advanced stuff that you could do too like quarto is very powerful you can make books from it slides all kinds of different formats um and so it's the same you know for making any kind of technical content uh as well so yeah it's it's really exciting yeah and it's a whole different philosophy of how to write software um and uh yeah i think it's you and i have both got the experience now that it's made us more productive and we're having more fun so it's good to be doing this tutorial to think about people watching it that are going to join this journey as well so um, thanks everybody for watching and Hamill, thanks so much for joining in the tutorial um, <laughs> late at night before you're doing a keynote tomorrow. I really appreciate it. All right. All right. Sounds good. Bye. Thank you.